Here's our first question, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start reading the question, and then I'm going to talk about how you might think about answering it. So the first question reads, um, a teacher gave her students two mathematics tests on the same topics. The first test was given before revision of the topics, and the second test was given after revision of the topics. The two tests had the same maximum mark and the same difficulty, so they were out of the same number of marks, and they were the same difficulty as well. The box plots give information about the students' scores in these tests. And we've got first test before revision and second test after revision. Describe what, the effect, uh, what effect the revision had on the test scores of these students. You must explain how you reach your conclusions. Okay, so um, we need to make a conclusion. So that's something that we need to do uh, um, about what happened uh, with the revision. And so describe what effect the revision had. Okay, so let's look at this. So what we have here is two box plots. Now, when we have box plots, things that we can compare are, we can compare the median. Okay, so that's a useful thing to compare. And median is considered an average. Okay, so we can state the median and say that um, a median is higher than the other one, for example. So that's something that I can do. Um, I can state what the interquartile range is, so I can state the interquartile range, so that is upper quartile take away the lower quartile, and upper quartile take away the lower quartile here, okay, and I can see that this one is a little bit tighter, okay, this number is going to be a bit smaller than this number here, okay. I could also do the range, so largest value take away the smallest value, largest value take away the smallest value, and, and again I see it's smaller here than it is there. And there's one other thing that we can do, we can talk about the skew. Okay, so there's the three things that I said. One of them is the average, which is the median. Okay, so we can compare the median. Another one is a measure of spread. Okay, and that is either the interquartile range, okay, or the range. Okay, so one of those two. And the third one is the skew. And then finally, I'm going to make a conclusion. Okay, and there's actually two conclusions that we can make here. <clears throat> and either one of the two will give us that last mark. So... To get one mark, what we can do is we can state that the median is higher here than it is there and state what they are. To get another mark, we can state uh, what the interquartile range is here and what the interquartile range is here and state that it's smaller here than it is there. Now, for this same mark, instead of doing interquartile range, I could do the range. So I could do the range here, range here, state what they are, and then say that it's smaller here. And then I'm going to state something about the skew. So to find out the skew, I, I need to find, is the median closer to the lower quartile or the upper quartile? If it's closer to the lower quartile, it's got a positive skew, okay? If it's closer to the upper quartile, it's got a negative skew. And if it's in the middle, then it's symmetrical, okay? So I can state something about the skew. So I can check where the median is relative to lower quartile and upper quartile here. And I can state what it is here as well. So I'm going to say the skew for um, those test scores before revision is positive, negative, or symmetrical, and then I can say, the say, uh, say something like that, again, for the second test, which was after the revision. Now, finally, I need to make a conclusion. So that was the first three marks. Now, for the fourth mark, I can either think back to what I said about the medians and say, well, students, on average, perform better after revision. Okay, so that's one conclusion I can make. Or I can use the conclusion for the range or the interquartile range. So uh, if I had said interquartile range is smaller here than it was there, I'm going to say that the, uh, that, that the students perform more consistently after revision than before the revision. So there's two conclusions there that I can state. So here in the next question, this question is for five marks. Um, again, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to think, uh, try and understand what this table is telling me, and then try and understand the question and answer the question. So or give you hints about the question. So it says, the table shows information about the retail price index, or RPI, and the price of a second-class stamp in pence in United Kingdom for, uh, for January 1996, January 2006, and January 20, uh, 2016. So I can see that the retail price index has been given here. Okay, so I can see, uh, it looks like this is the base here. And then we've got um, a 29% increase going from 1996 to 2006. And then um, a 72% increase going from 1996 to 2016. Then I've got the price of the second class stamp. So this is the price. So this is how much it used to cost. 20p here, 23p there, 
and 54p there. Describe how the increase in price of a second class stamp, okay, so this is the first bit of this sentence. Describe how the increase in the price of a second class stamp compares with the RPI over the 10 years to 2006 and over the 20 years to 2016. So I need to do it twice. I need to check from 1996 to 2006, and I also need to check from 1996 to 2016. And what I need to do is I need to compare the increase in the price of second class stamp, so the increase in the price of second class stamp with the RPI. Now, RPI is a concept. RPI is the concept that um, prices in general are increasing or decreasing. It's a measure of that. So it's a measure of inflation, and uh, it looks at you know, certain items that you know, people might, uh, items and services as well that people might uh, purchase, and it you know, calculates a, a rough estimate of how much more a person is likely to spend in a whole year uh, compared to a previous year, for example. So RPI is for lots and lots of different prices, okay, and all of that has been put together and a value has been set. So let's see what this means. So this means that from, uh, in 1996, it was the basic, and then in 2006, we got 129, okay? So someone can expect to spend 29% more uh, money in 2006 than in 1996, you know, for... for for the same product, so roughly the same products. Now, we don't know exactly what those products are. There's actually lots and lots of different products. So that's what they're saying. So roughly 29% more. Now, the price of the second class stamp has increased by 3p. And I'm wondering, okay, so if I'm gonna compare it, did that increase by 29%? Okay, so if that has increased by 29%, then I can see that the price of the second class stamp increased in line with the RPI. Okay, now it could, maybe it didn't increase by 29%. So let, let's actually think about this. So if it's three more here, so three out of 20 is actually 15%. So the increase from 20 to 23p is 15%. So I, I, I can see that the price of the second class stamp did not increase as much as the RPI has. Okay, so as much as other products have. Okay, so that's something that I can say. So that's, um, I've done it, uh, I've compared it over the 10 years to 2006. Then I need to do over the 20 years to 2016. So from here to here. So I can see that the RPI has increased by 72%. And I'm going to check what value, okay. I don't, I, I can see that it's more than double. Okay, and if it's more than double, it's increased by more than 100%. I can see that quite easily. But I want to know exactly what value, okay? So I, I do need to actually work this out and say something about this. So, and, I, and I needed to do it for the other one as well. So when I did 23 over 20, okay, so that would have given me 1.15, okay? And, you know, if I was to find an index number for that, it would be 115. So the index number for here, for the price of the second class stamp here, is 115. And that's much less than the RPI, which is 129, okay? So I, want, I might want to do the same here. So I might want to do 54 divided by 20 and find what, uh, what percentage uh, this increased by and then compare it to the 72% increase in the RPI. Okay, so in this question we have, um, so I'll read it again and let's see what we have. Rahul, Lisa and Paul are investigating how much the workers in a company earn. They have been told that in a week the workers earn 260 pound or 370 or 510. Last week, 20% earned 260, 35% earned 370, and 45% earned 510. So I can see these different amounts have been earned in different proportions by the different people. So we've got Rahul, Lisa, and Paul want to work out the average earnings for these workers last week. So they want to find the average for these workers. So pay attention to that, average for these workers. Rahul thinks that they should find the mean of these um, uh, different amounts that they could have got, 260, 370, and 510. Lisa thinks that they should find the median of 260, 370, and 510. Okay, that would be quite easy to do. You can see it's going to be 370. Paul thinks that they should find the weighted mean of the earnings. Okay, and which one of these averages should they use? Give a reason for your answer. Now, 
In this case, it looks like Paul's answer would be the best. So the weighted mean would be the best because it takes into account the proportion of people that earn these different amounts. Now, usually when you look at a company, you might look at the median, but that's because there'll be a lot of people earning lots of different amounts. In this company, if there's only three different values, that's not many different values, and then the median could be very close to the lowest value or the highest value, and it may not be very good here, okay? So that's why Lisa's one is not a good idea. Rahul's one, I think it's quite obvious why that's not a good idea. So it's going to be weighted mean because it takes, into proportion, uh, takes these proportions into account. Uh, Rahul, uh, so the next question here, Rahul works out the mean of the earnings is 380, Lisa finds that the median is 370. Work out the weighted mean of the earnings for Paul. So you, what you're going to do is you're, you can multiply these uh, amounts by 0 0.2, 0 0.35, 0 0.45 and add it up. You, or you can do these numbers times 20, that number times 35, this number times 45 and then divide by 100. It, it depends how you want to do it. So in this next question, uh, we have um, the table gives information about the monthly average price per litre in pence of diesel over a period of five months. The table also gives some of the chain-based index numbers, okay, correct to one decimal place for this information. And we can see that, and there's two spaces here. Calculate the chain-based index numbers for August and September and write them in the table. Okay, so this number and this number. Give each value correct to one decimal place. Okay, so to find the chain-based index numbers, what we're going to do is we're going to take this price and this price, so divide them, so this one divided by that one, times it by 100, and that will be the value here. Give it to one decimal place. And because it's chain-based index number, there's no base number to go to, so we're going to, again, divide here. So this number divided by that number, times it by 100, write it here. Next question, calculate the geometric mean of the four chain-based index numbers. You must show you're working and give your answer correct to one decimal place. So this question says you must show you're working. We do need to show it. Uh, just stating the answer will not be good enough here. Um, so geometric mean, we can see that the chain-based index numbers, there's going to be four of them. Okay, so we're going to find the fourth root of um, 102.5, and this times thing here. So times 100.8 times the next number, uh, which is going to be the uh, chain-based index number for August, and the last one, which is the chain-based index number for September. Okay, and this you can put in your, in your calculator and get a value here. Now we need to interpret our answer. Now, when you're interpreting your answer, we always want to relate to context. Okay, so in this context, we had um, monthly average price. So this was monthly average price per litre in pence of diesel over a period of five months. Okay, so uh, depending on what this value is, so for example, this value might be um, maybe 103, for example, or 103.1. So if it's 103.1, because we would have given it to one decimal place, it, it could be something else, okay? So 103.1, for example, um, what we would say here is, because geometric mean is a measure of an average, okay, so it's an average, we're going to say, on average, uh, the price is increased by 3.1% per month, okay? Because we looked at the months, we looked at the chain-based index number, which is telling, telling us how the price is changing, and we found the average for that, okay? And that will tell us, on average, per month, what the price change is. So if it was 103.1 here, we, uh, we would say um, in increase of 3.1% per month on average, so here in this question, we have um, Tomoyo found the weight in grams of each of 100 cherries. Circle the two words from the list that best describes the data Tomoyo would have found. Okay, so it was the weight. Okay, so that is um, some numerical value in grams of 100 cherries. So, and weight also, okay, let's look at the words. So circle the two words. So quantitative. Qualitative, so it's not qualitative, it's quantitative because it's um, a numerical value. Um, discrete, actually it's not discrete. Weight ca uh, can't be discrete, okay? Discrete values are taking specific values, for example, one, two, three, four. Weight can take um, lots of different values in a continuous scale. For example, between one and two, we can have values like 1.3 or something like that. So it looks like it's going to be quantitative and continuous, and these, they don't look like they're relevant here. Tomoyo grouped the weights, and she then drew, the, uh, drew this diagram for her results. So she's got frequency here, she's got weight in grams here. 
The incomplete frequency table shows some information about her results. Complete the frequency column in, in her table. So we can see from three to five, okay, what the value is here. So we need to actually know what this value is. So th this is going to be 10, okay? So we can see it goes 10 up, so that's 10. And then we can see how much this jumps are, and then we can find out the heights of the different ones here. So we would have some frequencies uh, based on the heights here. Calculate an estimate of the mean weight of the 100 cherries. Now, if we're going to estimate the mean, we're estimating because we don't know the exact values between 1 and 3. Now, the best thing we can do is go to the midpoint, so approximate the midpoint, so for example, 2 grams here. So let's say these 10, uh, what was it? It was uh, weight in grams of 100 cherries. So it's 2 grams for 10 cherries. Then we can say 4 grams for however many we got there, 6 grams for this much, and 8 grams for this much. And we're going to multiply these. Okay, so we guessed that 8 grams was the value for all of those, or 2 grams was the value for these 10 cherries. So altogether, this is 20 grams altogether. Okay, so we're going to be multiplying those values. So I'll, I'll write the 2 down, and we would multiply it, and that will give us 20 here. And we'll get some more values here. If I add this, add this all up, it will give me the total estimated value in terms of weight in grams for all the cherries. Now, there were 100 cherries altogether, so this value here, I would divide it by 100, and that would give me an estimate for the mean of the 100 cherries. So this question starts, um, Richard works in an animal rescue center, and we have, uh, he wants to compare the weights of the male cats and the weights of the female cats, and we've got a table here. The table shows information about the weights in kilograms of a sample of male cats and the weights in kilograms of a sample of female cats. Okay, so this is some of the information. And we've been given lowest value, lower quartile, median, upper quartile, and greatest value. So we can sort of imagine a box plot here, okay? And um, we can see what the values are, but let's see what the question is first. Use the information in the table to compare the distribution of the weights of male cats with the distribution of the weights of female cats. Okay. So what does distribution mean? Distribution would mean what would generally the shape <coughs> or, you know, how would we compare the averages or range, the measure of spread? You know, what, what exactly would we say about those things? That's what... Uh, commenting on dis uh, distribution is, or comparing the distribution. Well, that's what that means, okay? And we need to interpret our comparisons, meaning that we need to relate back to the question. So, um, one thing that, and this is for two marks, okay? So one thing we can do is we can compare, the, uh, can compare an average, and we've got the median here that we can compare. That's going to be quite easy for us. So we can say that the male, uh, the, the male cats, they have a higher median than the female cats, okay? So on average, um, the male cats weigh more. So that's actually two marks there. So we, we compared the median, and then we said, uh, we interpreted it uh, for, for this data, so it was male cats on average weigh more. Uh, we could have also compared the range, um, so 5.4 take away 3, 4.6 take away 3, and state what they are, and then say, um, so I can clearly see that the male cats have a bigger range. So I can say that the male cats have a larger range than the female cats. I could have also compared the interquartile range. Okay, I could have compared the interquartile range and say uh, one is more than the other. And then uh, if I had used the range, for example, I can see range is bigger. I could have said that the male cats vary more in their weights. Okay, so there's more variation in the weights of male cats. Okay, and that would be your two marks there. So there's two different ways you could have got those two marks. Okay, you can compare the median, say which is more, which is less. So that's what comparing means. And then interpret meaning that we're going to say, uh, give a statement um, that on average male cats weigh more. Or we could have done it with a range, we could have done it with the interquartile range and state something about the variation of the weights. Now, the next question says the information for female cats is based on data collected from 47 cats at the center. Work out the number of these female cats uh, with a weight greater than or equal to 3.8 kilograms. Okay, so, so this is a value that's been given to us. Let's look for that here. And we can see that the upper quartile was 3.8. And it was 47 cats. Now, notice that 47 is one less than a multiple of four. Okay, so let's uh, work out where we're looking. So 47 plus one. And we know that 3.8 is the upper quartile, okay? So, you know, three quarters of the data 
is going to be you know, around here, and one quarter will be around that side. Okay, so let's find three quarters of that value. So divide this by four, and then times it by three. So I can do that and put a three here. And that will be 48, and 48 divided by four is 12. 12 times three is 36. So this is 36. Now, 36, okay, so we're looking at 36, and the 36th value is 3.8. So if we had all of these 47 values written out here, the 36th value, so let's actually put this there. So 36th value, 36th value would be 3.8. Okay, so I would have all the data, so let's just put a 36th value, and that would be 3.8, and there'll be other values there, other values on this side, okay? Now, our question is work out the number of these female cats with a weight greater than or equal to 3.8. So the 36th value is equal to 3.8, and the rest of them are greater. Okay, so how, what is the rest of them? So there were 47. 36 to 47, that's 11 more cats. So 11 plus this one here, so that's going to be our 12. So this question says uh, we've got a community frequency percentage graph, um, and this shows about, uh, so this shows information about the ages of the people living in the UK in 2014. Okay, so community percentage going up there, and that we expect it to go up to 100, and we've got the age of the different people. Find the 10th to 90th percentile, interpercentile range for this information. Okay, so uh, because it's 100 values, quite easy to find the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. So I'll, I'll be looking at the 90 here, going across and reading my value there. I'll be looking at the 10, going across, reading my value there. And I will do a subtraction, and that will be the uh, 10th to 90th percent, 90th interpercentile range for, for this data, and that will go here. Then we've got here are some statistics about the ages of the people living in Manchester in 2014. The median is 29. And the 10th to 90th interpercentile range is 53. So I would have some value here, okay, maybe more than 53 or less than 53. Uh, they've also given me the median. So maybe perhaps it will be useful for us to find what the median age is. So the median age will be found here where the 50 is. So you can go across and then read what the median age is there, okay? Now let's see what the question is. So the question is telling us we need to compare the distribution of the ages. So again, compare the distribution. Uh, comparing the distribution would mean we state something about an average or we state something about um, the, a range or you know, some measure of spread. And then uh, let's see what else it says. Compare the distribution of the ages of people living in Manchester in 2014 with that of the UK uh, in 2014. So we can compare the median age, okay, and then maybe one is more than the other or one is less than the other, and we're going to say that on average, so we're going to compare the median ages and state, you know, what they are. Then we're going to say uh, this is more or less or, you know, people in Manchester are older or younger than the people in UK. Um, we could also, be, because this is for three marks, that would be two marks. Okay, maybe we need to say something else. We were also given the interpercentile range from 10 to 90th percentile in Manchester, and we worked it out for the UK. So what we can do is we can state something about the interpercentile range and which one is more, which one is less. And if it was for four marks, we could have also stated that um, uh, ages in Manchester may be very more or less than ages in UK. Now, the next question we've got. The table below gives more information about the ages of people living in Manchester in 2014. So we've got the mean here, and we've got the standard deviation here. We need to calculate the skew for the ages of the people uh, in Manchester in 2014. Okay, so we need to calculate the skew. Now, for this, we actually got the formula at the, at the front. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to paste it here, and then I'll, uh, I'll carry on the question. Okay, so here's the question again with um, the formula here. So this was in the formula sheet. Uh, so we need to calculate the skew for the ages of people living in Manchester in 2014, okay? So <clears throat> we've got the formula here. So let's try and use that formula with the uh, numbers substituted in. So we've got three bracket. The mean has just been given to me, which is 32, okay? The median is on the other page, okay? Let's see what that is. It's 29. And we're going to divide that 
by the standard deviation which has been given to us, which is 19.3. Okay, so this will give me some value, and um, I'm going to put that value here. Now, I can see that this value is going to be positive because um, the mean is more than the median, so 32 take away 29 is going to give me a positive number here. Three times a positive number here would be positive. A positive number divided by a positive number would be a positive here. Okay, so it will be some positive number here. We need to interpret the skew in context. So it's going to be a positive skew. might be a, a slight positive skew. It might be a strong positive skew. Um, but, you know, it's either positive or negative, right? So let's say, for example, uh, we know it's going to be positive. So it's going to be positive skew. And what we can say about positive skew is we know the shape, look, uh, the shape of the distribution would look like this, okay? And what you will find is many of the data would be here, okay? And that would be the young, younger people. So there will be a lot of younger people um, if there is a positive skew. If it's a slight positive skew, again, we can still say that there'll be more younger people than there are of older people. Okay, so in this question, we have um, the box plots give information about the distributions of the ages of the trees in acorn wood and in pine wood. So two different uh, places, and we've got the distribution of the ages of the trees. And we can look at the uh, box plots, and we can clearly see there's big differences here. Justify by calculation that 70 is an outlier for pine wood. So this is an outlier. We need to justify that using some calculations. So there are two ways we did this, and the formulas for this are not given. Uh, one was using standard deviation. The other one was using interquartile range. Okay? Now, in this information here, where we've got a box plot, the interquartile range is what we're going to use, because there's no way we can find the standard deviation here. So what you're going to do is you're going to find the lower quartile here, what the value is, and what the value of the upper quartile is. Find the interquartile range, so subtract them. Then what you're going to do is we're going to multiply that interquartile range by 1.5. So that's the value that we use. So we're going to multiply the interquartile range by 1.5. Now, we can go to the lower quartile and subtract that answer. Okay, so interquartile range times 1.5. And it might take us somewhere here. And we're also going to have to go to the upper quartile and add on whatever 1.5 times the interquartile range is and see where it is. Okay, so it might actually go here or here, but here it's actually saying justify by calculation. So it, we, we should expect it to be somewhere around here. Okay, and if it is here, we're going to say that uh, this value here, which is 70, is outside of our range. Okay, and therefore this is um, an outlier by calculation. Okay, so the last question continues, and it says here, Simon uses the information in the box plots to conclude that the average age, so this is what he's saying, so he says, the average age of the trees in acorn wood is greater than the average age of the trees in pine wood, so we can check that. Um, both distributions have the same spread, okay, so notice he's using words like spread and average. Uh, spread could mean lots of different calculations, actually, range or interquartile range. Both distributions have a positive skew, okay? Comment on Simon's conclusion. So is he right about the average and the uh, spread being the same here and the skews? So we need to comment on those things with reference to his use of statistical words. So he, when he said spread, we weren't actually sure. Is he thinking about interquartile range or is he thinking about range? What exactly is he thinking about? And when he said average, you know, is, is he, does he mean median? So th this is what we're thinking about here. So with reference to his use of statistical words, that's what uh, this part is really referencing to. And the accuracy of his statements, okay? So we need to check if he's actually right. So comment on his conclusion, so that this, we need to check if he's right, and we need to see, okay, what these words are that he's using, and you know, should we be using other words? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy and paste um, the box plot side by side with this, okay, and then we'll carry on. Okay, so um, here's our box plot. Now, where he said the average age of the trees in acorn wood, so acorn was the first one, is greater than the average age of the trees in pine wood, which is this one. Um, I think we can say that he is right, okay, because we can see that the median is right. But here we're also going to talk about the fact that he used the word average, and he, you know, he should have really stated that the median is higher, okay? 
So um, that's something that we can say. Uh, let's think about the next line. It says um, both distributions have the same spread. So we might want to work out the interquartile range and interquartile range and check if he's right. So we will say that he said spread, okay, which is a bit vague. And um, we've checked the interquartile range and we find that um, you know, one is more than the other or they're the same or you know, we, we can check if he's right or wrong. Uh, we can also do it with a range. Now be careful when you're doing the range here because the range for the acorn wood would be this value, take away this value, and the range for pine wood would be this value, this outlier value, take away this value. And I can actually see, just by looking at this, that the range for this one is bigger. Okay, so if I mention the range here, I'm going to say he's actually wrong about the spread uh, because the range for pine wood is bigger than the range for acorn wood. Okay, and I would state what they are. Um, and I could also have done it with the interquartile range, and you know, if it's the same, then he might have been right. Okay, if it's different, then you know, we can say that he's wrong. Uh, both distributions have a positive skew, so um, I can see that that is wrong. Okay, so acorn wood, I can see this is a negative skew. Okay, so um, one, one thing you can do is you can sort of draw like a graph like that, okay, a sketch like that with a pencil, just faintly, and then think about, okay, what is this? This is actually negative skew, okay? And this one looks quite symmetrical, but make sure you check um, how many uh, boxes there are here and how many boxes are on that side, and check whether or not it is symmetrical. And um, if it's not, okay, say what it is. And it says both distribution has a positive skew, and you're going to say, okay, he is actually wrong. Acorn wood has a negative skew, and pine wood has a positive skew. And um, that's it, really. Okay, so we've mentioned about the, uh, the words that he used. We've mentioned about, you know, median. We mentioned IQR or range. Then we said uh, something about the skew, and we said he was wrong about that. So here's our next question. It says, Peter thinks that the ages at inauguration uh, of the presidents of the USA are normally distributed. He collects information about the ages at inauguration in years of 43 presidents of the USA from the internet. The group frequency table gives uh, information about his results. And um, what we have here is we've got um, you know, ages in a range, so 42 to 47, 47 to 52, and we've got the frequency as well. Write down one disadvantage of collecting information from the internet. Okay, so this is just on its own, actually. It doesn't really relate back to the question. Okay, so collecting inf information from the internet may be unreliable. It could be out of date. Um, you could state something like that. The next question, Peter uses a spreadsheet to calculate the following summary statistics for the information in the table. And he's got the sum of all the frequency times the x value. So. Uh, it looks like maybe he's gone for the midpoint here and multiplied it by the frequency and he's added them all up, okay? So it's like midpoint times that is here, midpoint times that is here, and he's added all of that up, and that's the value he's got here, 2,361. And here what he's done is he's got um, the sum of frequency times uh, the, this value squared, okay? So that's what he's got there. And where the values of x are the class midpoints. Okay, they, they actually said that's the midpoints. Show that an estimate of the standard deviation of the ages at inauguration is uh, 6.29. You may use Peter's summary statistics. Now, when we do the standard deviation, we know that there's two formulas. And based on the information given to us, we will decide which of the two formulas are better. So I'm going to copy and paste the two formulas, and then I'll carry on from there. Okay, so here are the two formulas for the standard deviation. And I can see that because I've been given these values, this second formula is actually very easy to use. Uh, this one is going to be a lot harder to use. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, if I wanted to use this one, I would have to use the data from here, and it would, it, it would be a lot harder. So let's use this second um, one and, and fill it in. So this uh, sum of the x squares would be this value here. Uh, there were 43 presidents, so I can add up the frequencies and find that is 43. So n is 43. Uh, the sum of the, uh, all the x values is two, uh, uh, 2,361, so that's there, and divided by 43 as well. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that out here with the values. So it's going to be this first uh, value would be here, okay, and that you're going to divide by 43. You're going to take away, and you're going to say 2361 divided by 43. 
and square it. Put that into your calculator and then check to see if that does in fact give 6.29. So here's our next question. It says the table shows information about houses for sale in Oxford. And we can see it's got a number of bedrooms and we've got um, how many houses were, uh, are for sale, okay? And the total there as well. An estate agent says the mode of the number of bedrooms for these houses is three. Explain how she knows this. Um, so, so she can, uh, mode is the most frequent value and she can see the highest frequency here is for three bedrooms. Okay, so 420 and you would just state that. The estate agent wants to investigate the prices of these houses. She, took, she takes a stratified sample of 60 houses. So this is, remember, 1,200 houses. 60 houses, a stratified sample according to the number of bedrooms, okay? So work out the number of houses in her sample for each number of bedrooms, okay? So there were 140 houses with one bedroom out of 1,200. So what we would do is we would work out that proportion, 140 divided by 1,200, and multiply it by 60, okay? And that's gonna give us some value, and we can put that value there. For the next one, we can do 300 divided by 1,200 times 60, and so on for the rest of them. So our next question. Uh, we have X and Y are two events. The Venn diagram shows information about the probabilities of events related to X and Y happening. And we can see that here. Find the probability of event Y happening. So I can see this circle is for event Y, and I can see there's two values there. I would need to add them up. Uh, we need to find the probability of x and y. Okay, so that is the intersection of x and y, and that will be here. Find the probability of y given x. Now, y given x is actually the probability of y and x, so y and x, over the probability of x. Okay, so the probability of y and x, or x and y, is 0 0.3. And probability of x, I can work it out looking at that. Uh, I would work this division out and state what the probability is. Two different events, A and B, are independent. Okay, so independent. The, the thing about the independent events is that the probability of A and B, you, what you would do is you would multiply the probabilities of each of these. Okay, so that, that's one of the main things about independent events. Then we've got probability of A is given to us 0 0.8 and probability of B is 0 0.5. We need to find the probability of A and B and we said when they're independent, we could just simply multiply them, okay? So this is the case when they are independent. So what, what we, we would do is 0 0.8 times 0 0.5 here. Yeah. 